this talk takes about 40 minutes, uh, 40, 45 minutes. We'll have some questions and answers in the end, but I do, I do have to get going. My time, four o'clock, which is what your time, seven o'clock, I guess. Um, anyway, so we're going to talk about uh, how to make a dual band J pole out of a single band J pole. And what I'm going to uh, introduce you to is pretty well known, pretty well established. It's in QST. I mean, it's it was published in QST. It's in the Antenna Compendium. Uh, it's also in the Antenna Classics. I believe it's also in the latest uh, AWR handbook. So it's a pretty well established technique we uh, uh, introduced all about 20 years ago. Um, and here was the front page article on the right side. We subsequently introduced a roll-up version. A lot of people wanted this roll-up version. It's a great antenna. Can you make it into a little package roll-up? I'll show it to you. Um, same concept, but more in a roll-up portable so you can go backpacking or um, camping and things like that. And then uh, we also introduced in 2017 a tri-band version. Uh, not available in a roll-up, but available in a base. And that, this is a request from FEMA. So this was also published in QST. There's a request from FEMA of whether, you, can you make a, that's a great antenna that can go two meters, 220, 440, all in one pole, no radials, reasonable performance, low cost. And we worked on this for a while uh, with my students, play, played around with it. And uh, yeah, we got this one going. And yeah, they've ordered thousands of these now. So if you ever work with FEMA, you'll see some of these. They're two meter, 220, 440, all in one, um, and fed. So you feed it from the bottom. Uh, and it works you know, fairly well. I, mean, I think good enough for what they want. And it's not very tall. It's about uh, six, about six feet tall. That's my daughter, their KJ6 QXM. Um, she's an engineer also, bachelor's and master's and uh, master's in mechanical, a bachelor's in mechanical, and also a master's in electrical. Uh, and we had to also patent some of these. I didn't do it initially. In fact, the antenna I'm going to talk about today, we did not patent. We just didn't think we should patent it, but people start copying it. People start selling it on eBay. People start selling. People start selling it on eBay, saying, "Here's the Yet Fong antenna," and it, which was still okay with me. Um, well, we start, but when my students start purchasing some of them, we couldn't find a single one that worked right. It's very tricky to get this antenna working right. If you're an antenna guy, you have a good network analyzer, sure, but it's not you just can't follow the dimensions. You know, when I mentioned it in an article, you folks have read. It's the velocity factor. So every time you buy different materials, it's going to be slightly off. I mean, you guys in antennas will know there's a quarter inch here, an eighth inch here and there, especially at UHF. Um, so that's when uh, our patent attorney, Mike Coffin, said, you got to patent this stuff because people are going to copy it. It's going to give you a bad name, right? They copy it and they copy it wrong and they said it's the end of antenna. So we, we did patent our gain j pole. We did patent uh, a tri-band antenna we had. Um, okay, so why did I choose a J-pole? to try to make a dual band. I mean, why do we want a dual band to begin with? Well, this was 20 years ago, and we were walking up and down the flea market, and I was all of a sudden by, you know, in the year 2000, 2001, 2003, um, hardly anyone was buying single band handy talkies anymore and single band mobiles. You know, for an extra, if, if you're thinking about buying a handy talkie, uh, you might as well get a dual band. It was maybe $50 more for a mobile, maybe $75 more. You, you might as well add UHF to it. But the problem was the antenna. Which we use for an antenna. Uh, you can buy one, but they're another hundred, hundred fifty dollars. So I started thinking about this. I said, "Hey, uh, there must be an easy way to make a good dual band antenna. Not a dual band antenna, but a good one." So I started out with a J pole. I said, "Well, I like a J pole. It's got no radials. It doesn't need a lightning arrestor because it's a DC short circuit. Has a pretty good ideal um, uh, dipole pattern in a vertical direction, and it's end fed." And, and, and let me show you this. Uh, well, you know, this configuration, you guys are probably used to, to, to doing now. You know, when I was growing up, you know, we used ground planes. We made little ground planes because that's all I knew how to make. These are a little SL239 connected, flip it and uh, get some number 14 wire, you solder it and put some radials on it, and it works. And the SWRs are fine. But, but it turns out performance wise, uh, it's okay. Uh, but a J pole is actually much better. It gives about one and a half dB better performance. Uh, so you'll notice this. If you guys have played around with this, you'll, you'll notice it. Hey, it's not night or day, but it, 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 there is a difference. But mainly, I like the J-Pole. It's a DC short. You just see, we'll show you. That means you don't need a lightning investor. And it's also N-Fed. N-Fed in that you can hold it up on the bottom. That makes a big difference. 
when you can hold it up from the bottom as opposed to something that uh, has radials. And, and I'll show you this. Uh, I think we should be able to see this. Here, in my room here. Um, you see this? Here's an antenna. You can hold it from the bottom easily, but you can't hold it horizontally very easily because of the torque. You know, my wife has this background thing turned on. Let's see, let me turn this off on this. Let me turn off the background. Blur my background. Let's see. Choose virtual background. You don't choose, how do I eliminate this? None, none, right? Ah, there, there you go. That's our workroom here you see in the background. That's a little better. Um, yeah, now you can see it. See, if you have an antenna, you can hold it up vertically very easily, but you can't hold it horizontally very easily because of the torque. And that's the same goes for radial. We used to use radials and all our antennas, they would just fall apart, especially at repeater sites. Winds blowing, you know, 100 miles an hour easily in the wintertime and the harsh weather could, just, could fall apart. And so, you know, it's interesting. I'll show you this picture. Whoops. I took this picture years ago. And that's from San Francisco. This was at Mount Sutro. You wouldn't know this. This is like their main radio hill. All the commercial and police and fire antennas up there. And I tell you what's interesting. There's not a single antenna I could see here that has radials. Which means they're using some kind of a J-pole design. It's just a superior design. It's taller. You know, a ground plane is a quarter wavelength tall, radials with a quarter wavelength. A J pole is three one quarter wavelengths. But, you know, VHF, that's not a big deal. Three one quarter wavelengths. I mean, at HF it would be, but at VHF and UHF, no. So then there's no radials. So these things just stand up really, really well to, to wind and weather conditions. See, you take like what we used to use. Dipoles. If you guys worked on repeaters, you worked on these four bay dipoles or even a single or two bay dipole on top of a repeater site. The problem with the dipole is you've got to center feed it. Not that it doesn't work, it works fine, but physically, when you look at an antenna, you have to consider both the physical and the performance. They're both important. This performs okay, but how long would this last? This, this one I could tell you will not last up in the winds. The 90 degrees, this, the further you push this out, the better it performs because you move away from the mass, which acts as a reflector, especially if it's a conductor. But you can't move that that far out. Again, in mechanical engineering, the R cross F, the torque at that point, will be way, way too high. And if you're just soldering it with soft solder, the wind's blowing back and forth all summer long, all winter long, they break off. They all break off. You have to weld it. What we found is if you're going to use this, a well sure but it was a well we, most hands we solder will perform okay physically it just doesn't hold up and it's pretty expensive to all this copper stuff i hear costs quite a bit of money these days um so i like this j pole configuration j pole in a pvc pipe that uh this is what we did over 20 20 years ago my friend uh, Danny Monticelli actually gave me this uh, uh, ribbon J uh, made of 300 ohm twinly. Now I'll, I'll show you this in a while. And I I took a look at it and it worked really well. I mean, it's a very simple antenna in a uh, just a, a, a twinly. I'll, I'll show it to you here. Let me get one. You can see my video. It all fits in a little bag here. This is what he gave me. He made it out of 300 ohm twin lead. And I took it home and it actually works quite well. So I said, man, we got to put this into a PVC pipe and make it a base station. And you can, you put it in a PVC pipe and a PVC pipe is cheap, protect it off the weather. And the PVC pipe is treated for UV lights and quite durable, it lasts for years. And we've, we've sold well over 35,000 of these antennas like this now. Uh, let's see. So, but that was a, like a single band. I'll, I'll show you the configuration. It was this. 
basically you get a piece of 300 on Quinley, which today is hard to buy. You can still buy it at HRLs, but there's more radio shacks. But it's basically a half wave antenna. Two meters, half wave is 36, 37, 38 inches, depending what frequency you're at. But normally you would have fed it in the middle because that's a low impedance point with coax. But the trick is then how, how do you feed it in the end? How do you end feed it? The ends are high impedance. So in order to make this end fed, just like any end fed antenna, you've got to have some kind of a matching transformer because you've got to feed it with a high impedance. So we feed it with a quarter wave stuff. Uh, how do we do that? Okay. Okay. So first of all, let's go back here. This antenna. We, we choose this, this dipole uh, or J-pole antenna. It operates on two meters. You know, this one's a sing single band. It's a single band. This one's approximately for, for, for two meters. And here, it works on two meters. But what people notice, is it kind of also works on UHF, 70 centimeters. Kind of works on it. They're absolutely right. They say, hey, my j pole works, but not very well. In fact, when you simulate it, it loses about six to eight dBs to, compared to its fundamental. So, so let me show you this here. If you simulate this on EasyNAC, one of these computer simulation programs, not that you, you can do this on Fedco, ADS, they all give you the same results in free space. So in free space, and that's a fair way for everything in free space. Here, here's the sky. Here's sea level. And here's the earth. So this, imagine there's vertical dipole held in free space. It radiates and it's fundamental with this figure eight pattern. So if you look, so it covers 360 degrees. Now you're, you're typically you're standing here. This is sea level. Your partner's standing here and he starts walking out. And here's the sky. So if you look from above, it's just kind of, this, this has got a, a elevation pattern. Um, it's 360 degrees coverage at the donut. Now, if you look from above, it's covering 360 degrees. And the great thing about a vertical dipole is you don't shoot the energy in, up into the sky. It's pretty confined to the earth. If they perform, a vertical dipole performs fairly well at the fundamental. Well, if now you go to the third harmonic, it also resonates. Turns out virtually all antennas do this. If I made a 100 megahertz dipole and you get your little nano VNA or whatever you have, you'll find it, it will also resonate at 300, 500, 700 until, until your limits of your coax and all that stuff becomes lossy. But if, if assuming that isn't there, it resonates at, at, at odd harmonics. So fortunate or unfortunate, if you have a two meter antenna, whether it's a ground plane or a J-pole, it will also resonate at UHF, but SWR, as you guys probably know, is necessary but not sufficient. It'll give you SWR. It'll resonate. I didn't say it would perform well. So when you simulate this thing, unlike EasyNet, the pattern's terrible. If this is sea level, you're standing here, your partner's standing there, where's all your energy going into? Four, about 66% of it, yeah, about 66% of it is going into the air. No, actually 75, I'm sorry, 75% of it. 75% is going right into the air at 45 degrees angle. So if you're an airplane flying by there, great. You're not. Your partner's here. You just, you know, 75% of your energy is just going up, you know, what we call cloud warming. And only about 25% of it is left here. That's pretty poor performance. That's what you don't want to do. So what we're going to try to explain in the seminars, how do you make this pattern at UHF look like this pattern, both at VHF and UHF? on a single antenna. So that's the goal here. Uh, so here are the requirements. If you're going to make a modification or design for a ham, it's got to be simple, reproducible. We don't want radios. You can't use fancy inductors. No one's going to be able to buy that. Yeah, maybe you can buy a few coils here and there. You can't use any capacitors, at, not at UHF and VHF. Now, if I specified, oh, you need this eight picofarad capacitor or whatever to match it, uh, you wouldn't be able to buy that. I mean, maybe I got a hold of one, but if, if, if you put that in a network analyzer, it may be eight picofarads at 30 megahertz, 10 megahertz, but it won't be, I guarantee you, it won't be eight, eight picofarads at 400 megahertz because 
at those frequencies, you've got self resonances, you've got series inductance that starts coming into play, you've got series resistance. It'll resonate by itself because of its internal uh, parasitic capacitance. So you can't request that. And, and in fact, what, what's strange is I've seen some good, not commercial antennas, ham antennas, but major manufacturers start using capacitors for matching and ceramic ones. I've, I've torn apart like the X200 has got two capacitors in it. They're ceramic. They're not even micas. I mean, how can that possibly work? I don't know. Because you can't use those for matching. I mean, at HF, you can, but, but not at UHF. Um, and I have those antennas. Yeah, they don't work as clean. Um, so I tried a lot of different configurations. So no capacitors, no inductors. Uh, what you're left with is coupling stubs. So let me show you what we did. So the only thing you got to learn in this or understand this is how Smith chart works for quarter wave stubs. What the Smith chart shows is with a quarter wave stub, if you start out with a short circuit, a quarter wave later, which is 180 degrees, it will read a very high impedance. Probably not infinity, but very, very high. Uh, similarly, if you have an open circuit, it would actually show a short circuit a quarter wave later. Hard to believe sometimes. Um, I know my graduate students, the new ones, the non-hams, they never can get this right. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll show you this. Uh, let me get a quarter wave stub here. Let's, let's have one somewhere. Okay. Okay. Here's a piece of um, RG58 coax. It's about five inches long. Five inches long. Hey, no, 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 no trick. It's an open circuit on both ends. It's a quarter width stuff. Well, it turns out that that's trickier than you might think. If you short one end, you think it's a DC short. It is. But if you move one quarter away for UHF, for UHF, it's about five and a half inches, you know, 450 megahertz. It will be an open circuit. And similarly, if I were just to put a network analyzer in here at 450 megahertz or so, it will read a short circuit. So I, I'm, a lot of you experience hands will know that. You, Try quarter wave stubs, opens and shorts, and things like that. So you take full advantage of that. This is how a J pole basically works. Single band. This is not a dual band version. We have a dipole here. We know the dipole here. And we know if you center feed it, it you take a coax and about 50 ohms. And, and again, at two meters, half wave, 36, 37, 38 inches, depending on you know, where you want to resonate in that range. And you would set and feed it, but I showed you another slide. It's physically not a good idea to do that. It's you got to hold it up with 90 degrees, and you got to be away from the mass to have it perform well. The further it is from the mass, the better it performs. But then you have the torque right where you interface it at 90 degrees. Oh, so you got to hold that really, really tight. And it just won't hold up on top of mountaintops. Now, I'm 68 years old. I've put enough repeaters. I've climbed enough towers and on mountaintops and seen enough antenna problems with the harsh you know, winter conditions. So you need something really simple. I find that, uh, that it works. It's got to work, too. That's end fed. So how do you do this? If the end of a dipole is high impedance, because the center of a dipole is low impedance, about 50, 60 ohms or so, but the ends are several thousand ohms, how do you interface that if you want this thing end fed? You need some type of uh, impedance matching system. Ah, I just showed you about the quarter wave stub. The quarter wave stub. If you short circuit it on one end, you go up a quarter wave, it would be an open circuit. I mean, that open, high impedance, very, very high impedance. So it'll go from zero to, oh, thousands, equivalently thousands of ohms up there, which will match great with the other end of that dipole. And then, what you see is, ah, this is zero ohms and this is thousands of ohms. Well, 50 ohms is about, you know, one, one and a quarter inches up from the short, right? 50 ohms is close to the short to infinity. That kind of makes sense. You tap it off and sure enough, that's how a J-pole works. And if you were to map the voltage uh, waves on the stub, it would be obviously zero for a short. And, and as you're driving the signal, it will go up. Uh, the voltage will go up. 
I'll bet you that is a spam caller. Hold on. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm going to get these calls all day at home. Um, so you can match this. This is how a regular JPO works. Zero ohms, high impedance matches to the halfway end fed. And then somewhere around one, one and a quarter inches, depending on the material used, will be about the 50 ohm source. And you put a network analyzer and then, hey, not bad. Pretty good SWR and it works. So how do you make this dual band? This antenna works and it works well at VHF. So let me show you, hang on, I forgot. Let me show you, so, so this configuration is a pretty standard configuration. It's implemented in, some people have done it with a copper pipe. And by the way, uh, a friend of mine, we saw him, I saw me this weekend. He says, do you realize that you built one of these copper J poles? Which by the way, we have built, let me go get, hang on, it's in the other room, hang on, hang on. Let me show you this. Here, we have built these. I have my students build these. Unfortunately, the price of copper pipe to build this and all the connectors and all this, man, it's about $50 in copper now at your local uh, Lowell's or your local Home Depot. So I would not recommend building this antenna anymore. Maybe years ago when copper pipe was cheap, that was okay. But copper pipe is no longer cheap because you need the T connectors, the elbows, and you need quite a bit of piece and they're expensive. They are expensive if you ever price this stuff. Now, this antenna works. Um, at VHF, uh, we find it, it's okay. Um, again, this is the half wave piece. Same concept, right? It's, it's the same concept here, just implemented differently. You're making a transmission line out of copper pipe out of this T and this elbow like that. And this is the transmission line, see? And it, here's where you tap it. About uh, this case, whatever it came out is about an inch and a half up, the 50 ohm point. Now, what we what we find, what we can't use this for is we can't use it at UHF. It doesn't work very well at UHF, mainly because the spacing is too wide here, right? At UHF, you figure cord weighs five, six inches. You can't expose horizontally almost two inches. You would lose too much of your energy. And also this transmission line, it's about one and seven eighth inch, I think the spacing. It isn't a very good efficient transmission line in UHF. It's acceptable at VHF. You know, VHF quarter wave is 18 inches. That's about one and seven eighths, not the greatest. I would much rather use twin lead where the two spacing is very, very close. It's a very good transmission line, but this still works at VHF, we've built these. At UHF, no, it's a, it just radiates all over the place, very inefficient. Um, so that's one configuration that people try. Arrow has tried this configuration, which I didn't build, we just bought one. We ended up just buying it because it's too hard to build. It's too expensive with aluminum, but you can buy these. I don't know what they cost now, but they're probably $60, 70 on pretty expensive. Um, it's a very well-built antenna, it'll hold up. Uh, in terms of performance, um, what they did was, let me show you what they did. Here's the two meter VHF section. You see these dimensions there? And it actually, the longest will be is 19.25 inches. And I think we measured a little less than that, depending how you want it, where, where you want it to resonate. That's the two meter one. And what they do is they parallel it with the UHF. So the UHF J pole is this piece and they add the six and a half inch piece. So that's the UHF. And the VHF is this long piece here. And then they put it through one single connector in the bottom. It's actually isolated. It, uh, th th this, this, this middle piece is not um, same ground as this. So, But it's the same input for both VHF and UHF. So how does this antenna work when we uh, tested it? Not bad. So when you plug in a VHF signal, obviously it comes through this section. If you plug in a UHF sig signal, what you would like is you want it to be driven by this section here. But just the small unfortunate part is 
the VHF section is still in there. So this section still resonates at the third harmonic. So what happens with this antenna is you feed in a VHF signal, you're fine because it won't resonate the UHF. It's this section and this section that seems to work. You feed the UHF section, since it is a low impedance matching point and also the third harmonic of this section and then also the UHF section, as an approximation, half the energy of the UHF signal goes into here, the other half goes into here. And the other half that goes into here, well, you lose about 75% of it blasting into the sky. So it's an improvement, uh, but you can measure the difference between ours and theirs. Uh, they lose, again, because the other half of the power of UHF does go into the section. And that's the one where you lose 75%. So that's an interesting concept, interesting concept. Um, and another thing I just want to demystify is, um, you guys probably hear the Slim Jim configuration. Well, in a Slim Jim configuration, we see nothing advantageous, but there's no advantages to this, except the regular J-Pole. They, you hear rumors about, oh, you can short the top of a twin lead and get 6 dB gain. It does not give you 6 dB gain. It, it doesn't harm it. It doesn't seem to harm it. It does, it performs about the same. I think Larry Seepik, when he was alive, he did a lot of experiments because he didn't believe it worked. And, he, and all his evidence, and he's had pretty sophisticated equipment who had a David IRRL. No, it's just a regular J pole antenna. So, what is it that uh, you guys came here to hear? You want to hear how do you make that basic antenna into a, a dual band? So, first of all, let, let, I'll show you. So remember, the matching is not the problem. Let's, let's just cover this part. Just cover this matching part. How you match into a high impedance point. We showed at VHF, it requires a quarter wave stop. It's a short circuit here. It goes to high impedance up there. And it's, it's about 16 and a half inches. You would say, it shouldn't a quarter wave is in it 18 inches or 17 inches. Well, not in a twin lead. In the twin lead, it's about 16 and a half because... When you calculate the formula of quarter wave at two meters, 18 inches, that's an air. Where do they get that from? They get that from the formula C is equal to F lambda. The speed of light is equal to the frequency times wavelength. And if you use the speed of light in air, which is three times 10 to the eighth meters a second, hello? I think that's, well, I get all these calls. Sorry about that. Um, when you use it in air, and, and light travels at approximately three times 10 to the eighth meters a second in air. But if you put it in twin lead, it's called the velocity factor. You, you experience hams will know that. That wavelength will not travel at three times 10 to the eighth meters a second in any plastic, any coax. It slows it down 10, 20, well, maybe 20, 25%. That's called the velocity factor. In fact, in twin lead, it's about, what is it, about 15, 20%. That's why it's a little shorter. Instead of 18, 19, it's 16 and a half. That's a quarter wave in that piece of twin lead. But again, if you look at the waveform, it's a short circuit down here. And then it's a high impedance up here because it's going up a quarter wavelength. So if you drive this with a signal, obviously a short circuit is going to be zero signal, right? That short. But if you move up, as the wave moves up the quarter wave, its voltage goes up. And as, as voltage peaks, that's also when the current goes to a minimum, which means it's a high impedance point. So that's what happens at VHF. And then it wants to see a half-wave radiator. Yes, here it is. Half-wave radiator at VHF, you add 11 and a quarter, you add four and a quarter, you add 17. And that's about 37 inches if you add all that up. That's the half-wave. But what happens at UHF? That's our problem. What happens at UHF? Well, at UHF, remember I said all antennas, virtually all that we know, if you, if you make an antenna that resonates at 100 megahertz, it will also resonate at 300, 500, 700, et cetera. Why? Because at UHF, remember you have three times, that's the first odd harmonic, three times the frequency, 150 times three is about 450. So what happens here? If you drive this with a UHF signal, you still start out with a short, so it's a short circuit, so zero. You go up about five inches. In this case, five inches, you see a peak. But nothing else happens, you're right here, five inches. You go another five inches, another quarter, you're going around the Smith chart basically. Now you've gone around 360 degrees you go back to zero on the Smith chart. And then you go another six or five inches. It goes back to a peak. Ah, it happens to that same peak. So that's why every odd harmonic, you will always get a rematch. So 
So it's not the matching is not a problem at UHF. You just went through an extra uh, 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 circulation around the Smith chart, halfway, 360 degrees. And you're back to the same point. You start all over, and, and five, six inches later, wow, you're at a peak again, high impedance. It matches that dipole you had, except what you would like to see at UHF, what you would like to see at UHF is only about 11 or 12 inches. Right? If you go back to, now that I've explained that, if you want to work, if you want this antenna to work at UHF, just cut this thing off. Instead of 37 inches, make it 11, 12 inches. The matching's already there. It will work. But then it won't work at VHF. So what happens here at UHF, I'm repeating UHF signal, why do you get those lobes? It's because here it wants to see about 11 or 12 inches, cut out, it'll radiate just fine. But if it's a continuous conductor, like in this case, here, 37 inches for two meters, the current continues to go up. It's supposed to stop and radiate. It doesn't. It sees a copper wire. So it continues. That's where those lobes come up. You start forming those. The current continues to go up. So how do we stop that? Again, go back to this quarter wave stuff. So we use this quarter wave stuff principle here and up here. We put a piece of coax here. We short it. We short circuit it at top. Remember, a short circuit, a quarter wave later will be an open circuit. It may not be infinity, but it's in the several thousands of ohms, you know, much more than 50 ohms. If it's in the several thousands of ohms at that resonant frequency, in this case, our UHF handband, and it turns out to be about four and a quarter, four and a half inches. Again, it's not six inches because it's in the coax. In coax, the signal does not travel three times 10 to the eighth meters a second at the speed of light. It travels 20% oh, slower, 20 to 30, depending on the coax, 20 to 30% slower. So that, that, that stub now is not five or six inches. It's more like four and a quarter, four and a half inches. And if you short the top, it's going to be an open circuit at UHF, only at UHF. At two meters, it's not resonating, so it goes right through. So when you, when you excite this with two meters, it just sees 11 and a quarter, four and a quarter, 17. But at UHF, it stops it. it it's a trap, right? It's a coaxial trap. You can try to make an inductor trap, but it's kind of hard to put an inductor and a capacitor there. I just, it's, it's, you probably can do it with very high quality capacitors. In my case, put, put a, RG174 piece of coax, and it seems to work fine. So, and then you can make a, so you stick this into a PVC pipe. Now, when you stick this into a PVC pipe, you got to consider, again, the velocity factor. These are a little shorter than you expect because the PVC pipe slows down the wave again, about 5%. That means you got to make it 5% smaller than what you would think in air. In fact, the roll-up one, the roll-up one's about two inches taller. This is the one you can wrap up, take, take backpacking. We make that with a with a BNC connector at the bottom, and then um, with some RG one seventy four, and then we also have, have a adapter you can put and other other adapters. You can roll this up, but it's, it's designed to just operate in air, but. Uh, Let's see. Okay, let's see, take a look. Oh, yeah, we just discussed that. So in the pipe, in the PVC pipe, we optimize it for Lowell's item 23990, inexpensive PVC pipe. They didn't have us in mind building antennas. It's really a sprinkler pipe. But it turns out the tolerances are very, very good. 23990 is very, very good. Well, we keep on calling. Got to ignore it. Hello? Is this Ed? Yes, but I'm on a seminar right now. Sorry, you can call back later. Sorry? Well, second, okay. See how busy I am? <laughs> uh, um, okay, so 23990 is cheap 10 feet for 350 or $4 like that. So it's really inexpensive. Turns out this quality control is quite, quite good. Uh, let's see. So here's the performance. I think yeah, that's what you're interested in. How does the thing perform? This technique actually works. I was surprised. I mean, I tried, believe me, I tried a lot of things. This one actually worked and it met the requirements. Simple, and I believe people can go build it provided they have a good uh, network analyzer. Um, so here's the two meter J pole, standard one at UHF. 
uh, this is like, like this is nothing fancy. Just sitting out in a parking lot with a, with an HP spectrum analyzer and a signal generator it sits here. So this is with the loss, you know, seventy five percent of it going into the air. Now, you use our antenna with that little stub, just that little stub, to stop the UHF signal from continuing on, creating those lobes. You have a trap. And you sure enough, this is 10 dB per division. So this is like 6 dB right there. You gain back 6 dB. That's a lot. I mean, it may only be this little thing on this graph because this is a log scale. 6 dB is four times. It's 4x. So it's quite a bit. It's not insignificant. And then we actually, um, I got these numbers. What these numbers are, the actual measured numbers on how you would evaluate an antenna. And the reason why I did this is one of my students wanted to learn how are antennas really evaluated at the National Bureau of Institute and Standards. You don't just say, hey, I think you sound good. Oh, you know, it's more quantitative than this. You've got to measure it. It's obviously calibrated equipment, in our case, key site and agent type equipment. Um, for an antenna, it's got to be done on a rainy day, on a foggy day, and on a clear day. And typically they recommend five measurements each, and then you take the average. And you know what we found when we did this? It does come really close to modeling, you know, the ideal stuff when you run it on a computer, really, really close. Uh, so I'll give you an example here. Um, the quarter wave mobile is, this is, again, just an empty park lot, uh, in a school park lot, because it, it was fairly clear in a, on a weekend. Uh, minus 24.7 dB was just a reference point with a generator and a spectrum analyzer. But sure enough, you know, when you put a rubber duck in place of, of that quarter wave ground plane, you do lose about 6 dB. That's exactly what it should use, a rubber duck compared to a quarter wave ground plane. And a standard j is a little better, minus 23.34, about 1.5 dB better. That's exactly what you would predict. And in our antenna, it's about minus 23.47, really close to standard j -pole. But our dual band can also do a UHF. So let's go to UHF. Now, the scale is a little bit lower because the attenuation is higher at UHF. Same situation, but at UHF. You get minus 38.8 dB. And it was like 50 yards in a parking lot. It's just a relative point. But in the exact same situation, we substitute a rubber duck. Uh, you know, at UHF, surprisingly, you don't get as much loss. You guys probably noticed this at UHF. A rubber duck compared to a regular antenna is not as bad. Not, not compared to VHF. VHF, you really see it. You do get a loss. A lot of loss, but UHF, you know, it's, it's acceptable. Three dB, two to three dB, not bad. Uh, but now you do see to use a standard VHF J pole, and it's about minus forty-five dB. It's worse than a rubber duck. If you use a standard J pole VHF at UHF, it is actually worse than a rubber duck. So the, the good news about using a standard J pole at UHF, the SWR is pretty good. You won't blow up your radio, but it won't perform that well. And I think most people will notice it. Unless the signals are very strong, you will notice it's not a very good antenna. But really what's important is it does not blow out your radio. That's good. And in our case of the dual band, wow, it almost comes right back to the quarter wave. Pretty good. So it does work. I mean, it's, good. it's a good 6 dB improvement here. At 40, uh, about 6 dB. That's a lot. It's, it's, it's very noticeable. So here's uh, when we originally did the antenna back in uh, 2003. Well, this, the photo was taken in 2008, though. This is a, our lab back then. You see these old scopes. Now we've got the super duper. We've got a new key site, 5062. Um, we got that in 2021. And that seems to be pretty good. It's an all PC based network analyzer, which is pretty cool. It, when you open it up, it's just, just a PC board that key site modified. And the whole instrument is really in this panel. All the microwave and all stuff is stacked vertically. It's, it's pretty neat. Uh, let's see, what else can I say? Oh, people wanted to see the stub. That stub, if you sweep it from 30 to 1 gig, sure enough, at 445, it kind of peaks right there. It's not infinity, but it's pretty high. And certainly enough to improve, uh, you know, improve over nothing. Uh, and it's pretty stable. I put my hands around it and everything, sweeping from 30 megahertz to one gig. Uh, the resonance is pretty stable. I mean, everything, of course, the non resonance is going all over the place, but right at 445, it's still there. So I like it. It works pretty well. Uh, and at 146, it looks like this. It's pretty much like an open piece of wire. 
Um, let's see. Oh, here it is. Again, here's the antenna. Again, when you, when you mount it at the bottom, it's quite durable. You don't have torque with it. So this holds up quite well. There's no radials. Um, this PVC pipe is all round. So all the wind kind of, you know, I've seen this thing in what, what, about 80 mile per hour winds in my house. I wonder how my antenna is doing. It really doesn't move. It's all round. Things move when they're square or we put a kite up or something like that. So it's good aerodynamic design. It holds up quite well. So this one's held up for about well, 20 years now. It's in pretty good shape. Uh, here, here's our roll up. See our roll up, we actually sell like this. Here's the antenna and it, it terminates in a BNC. And then we include the adapters for BNC to SMA and then male and then SMA male to SMA female. And then we also include an extension cable because this is hard to find. I mean, you can't, it's custom made. BNC male, BNC female, and the other end. So you just plug this in into that end and you get an extra six feet. You don't have to deal with a barrel and adapter and all that. So we actually order these by the thousands. Um, and you guys can order, uh, I'll, I'll give you a spreadsheet. Also, if you like, that's the end of the talk. Uh, any, any questions? Let's see. Yeah, I can open up for some questions before I leave. Feel free to ask questions now. I see the audience. No questions? Oh, I know you guys have questions. Uh, I have a question. Uh, sure. It's really, um, my, my curiosity really is, I, I know you make a tri-band version of this that's right. like two meter, uh, 220 and 70 centimeter. Is, is there a limit to, to what three bands you could use? Could you design an antenna like this that did like uh, two meter, 70 centimeter and like 1.2 gig? Or is that not really possible? Probably not. Design? No, because of the materials. The materials of Twindy and everything pretty much max out at about 500 megahertz. Yeah, if you've dealt with 1.2 gig, I think it's like a totally different um, topic, right? The materials you use, the losses, the connectors, it's it's quite a bit more difficult. In fact, you know, like that's the, even the cell phone folks, by the time they go up to 800 megahertz, they hardly ever use coax. It's all Heliax. It's very, really critical. No, it's probably, I mean, if, if you were to want another resonance at 300 megahertz in the, in between that range, sure. Yeah, you can do it. But 900, no. Uh, we've played around with this. Very hard to do. Thank, Thank you. you. That's a good question. Hey, let me get a show of hands. I see the audience there in the room. How many of you folks have used one of our antennas? Oh, none. You, you oh, no, I see some one. hands are going up. Okay. You, you broke up on that one. You might try the question okay. again. Okay. I was asking, a show of hands, I see the audience there. How many of you folks actually have one of our antennas and use them? I, I built one on your model. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I see. I see a few ways. Okay, good. Um, so I've got another talk on how you get gain. We also have one on a tri-band. How do you make a tri-band? Uh, oh, here, I don't sell these radios. I was just showing, tri-band radios are pretty inexpensive these days. The, these Balfangs and these uh, radio oddities and I think TYT or whatever, uh, they're in the $100 range. Uh, anyway, um, so thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I got to get going here. I want to relax a little before I give another lecture. Uh, I got to teach a class that. tonight. Uh, so we, we sell this. Whenever I give a presentation, we sell these antennas at about a 20% discount. Um, on our website, we usually store a fundraiser for my RF group. It's fifty-five. It's typically fifty dollars plus five dollars plus postage, and we have some two distributors also in the Midwest and back east. Um, same price, fifty-five dollars basically. But if you buy it through this talk, um, through Jack, I'll send him a spreadsheet. It's thirty-five dollars total, and that's a pretty good deal. Same thing with the roll-up with all the accessories. It's thirty-five dollars. The tri-band, instead of $90, is $65. So good 20, 30% savings. But you have to order it as a club. Uh, not as No, you can't tell me, I'm a club member and give a talk. No, you have to order it as a club because it's, it's, it's the time factor involved. So on the UHF antenna, we also sell a GMRS version. Gives you about 5 dB of gain. That comes in ham or GMRS. You can't use the same antenna. It's not wide enough band. Um, the extension cables are six feet, eight, uh, $6 each, and a lot of people request a BNC to PL259 adapter. 
relatively inexpensive because of grand quantity. The, the thing I didn't add to this is we do care. We do make a 220 antenna. Is, is there, are there 220 repeaters out where you guys are at? No. None? Okay, so you wouldn't, wouldn't be interested. So I'll send Jack a spreadsheet and he can send it out. And um, then I just want a summary and you get these really good prices. Again, 20, good 20% 20 off the website. That, that's a really, really good savings. Okay, otherwise, um, thank you for inviting me. And I'm sorry for this time. I just my schedule is so busy these days with uh, graduate students and teaching classes and trying to run this little business for my students. It, it raises good funds. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's it's well worth. These students get good experience. By the way, they do not build and tune the antennas. They get me all the pieces. We try. They do build an antenna in one of their labs. I cannot have them manufacturing. We'll lose too many. Years too many pieces from overcutting and all that. It takes quite a while to get this right and, and do it you know, effectively. What they do do is they drill a hole, they cut the wires for me, uh, they set everything up for me as possible. And then I basically put them together and tune them. Uh, and then, then that works out all well. And the other, the other good thing about that is I only get my students, master's students only get for about two, two years maximum. So if a defect comes back, what's the use, right? At, at, at some point, oh, that guy, oh, I think I so-and-so did this. They're all gone. So what I like to do is since I do the final test, I suspend whatever antenna is broken, you only can blame it on one person, me. So I like it that way because I'm, I'm consistent. So anyway, hey, again, thanks a lot, Jack, for inviting me. I got to get going. Unfortunately, I got to teach a class. So if you see some of the other talks you might be interested in, uh, I'm pretty booked usually. Um, but yeah, you just plan it out. Yeah, question? Well, thank you very much for uh, making the presentation tonight. And uh, when I get that spreadsheet, I will put together a club order.